Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off in Treasure Island, Jim Hawkins stumbled upon Long John Silver's crew and has thus been captured. Let's see what happens now. You ready? All right, let's begin. Part six, the final part, Captain Silver. Chapter 28, in the enemy's camp. The red glare of the torch lighting up the interior of the blockhouse showed me the worst of my apprehensions realized. The pirates were in possession of the house and stores. There was the cask of Cognac. There were the pork and bread as before. And what tenfold increased my horror, not a sight of any prisoner. I can only judge that all had perished, and my heart smote me sorely that I had not been there to perish with them. There were six of the buccaneers, at all told. Not another man was left alive. Five of them were on their feet, flushed and swollen, suddenly called out of the first sleep of drunkenness. The six had only risen up upon his elbow. He was deadly pale, and the blood-stained bandage round his head told me he had recently been wounded, and still more recently dressed. I remembered the man who had been shot and run, had run back up among the woods in the great attack, and doubted not that this was he. The parrot sat, preening her plumage on Long John's shoulder. He himself, I thought, looked somewhat paler and more stern than I was used to. He still wore the fine broadcloth suit in which he had fulfilled his mission, but it was bitterly but the worse for wear, daubed with clay and torn with the sharp briars of the wood. So, said he, here's Jim Hawkins, shiver me timbers. Dropped in like, eh? Well, come, I take that friendly. Thereupon he sat down across the brandy cask and began to fill a pipe. Give me a load of the link, Dick, said he, and then, when he had a good light, That'll do, lad, he added. Stick the glim into the, in the wood heap. And you, gentlemen, bring yourselves too. You needn't stand up for Mr. Hawkins. He'll excuse you, might lay to, uh, uh, you may lay to that. And so, Jim, stopping the tobacco, here you were, and quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I see you were smart when I first set my eyes on you, but this here gets away from the clean it do. For all this... As may be well supposed, I made no answer. They had set me with my back against the wall, and I stood there, looking silver in the face, pluckily enough, I hope, to all outward appearance, but with black despair in my heart. Silver took a whiff or two of his pipe with great composure, and then ran on again. <coughs> now you see, Jim, so be as you are here, says he, I'll give you a piece of my mind. I've always liked you, I have, for a lad of spirit and the picture of my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to jint and take your share and die a gentleman. And now, my cock, you've got to. Captain Smollett's a fine seaman, as I'll own up to any day, but stiff on discipline. Duty is duty, says he, and right he is. Just you keep clear of the captain. The doctor himself has gone dead again. You... Ungrateful scamp was what he said, and the short of the long of the whole story is about you, as about here. You can't go back to your own lot, for they won't have you, and without you start a third ship company all by yourself, which might be lonely, you'll have to join with Captain Silver. So far, so good. My friends then were still alive, and though I partly believed the truth of Silver's statement that the cabin party were incensed at me for my desertion, I was more relieved than distressed by what I heard. I don't say nothing as to your being in our hands, continued Silver, though there you are, and you may lay to it. I'm all for argument. I never seen good come out of threatening. If you like that service, well, you'll join. And if you don't, Jim, why, you're free to answer no. Free and welcome, shipmate, and if fair can be said by mortal seamen, shiver my sides. Am I to answer then, I asked, with a very tremulous voice. Though all the, through all this sneering talk, I was made to feel the threat of death that overhung me, and my cheeks burned and my heart beat painfully in my breast. 
Lad, said Silver, no one's oppressing of you. Take your bearings. None of us won't hurry you, mate. Time goes so pleasant in your company, you see. Well, says I, growing a bit bolder, if I'm to choose, I declare I have a right to know what's what, and why you're here, and where my friends are. What's what? repeated one of the buccaneers in a deep growl. Uh, he'd be a lucky one, as we'd know that. You'll perhaps batten down your hatches till you're spoke, my friend, cried Silver truculently to his this speaker, and then in his first gracious tones he replied to me, Yesterday morning, Mr. Hawkins, said he, in the wat dog watch, down came Dr. Livesey with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. Ship's gone. Well, maybe we'd be taking a glass and a song to help it round. I won't say no, leastways none of us had looked out. We looked out, and by thunder, the old ship was gone. I never seen a pack of fools look fishier, and you may lay to that, if I tells you that looked the fishiest. Well, says the doctor, let's bargain. We bargained, him and I, and here we are. Stores, brandy, blockhouse, uh, the firewood you was thoughtful enough to cut. And in a manner of speaking, the whole blessed boat from cross trees to Keelsome. As for them, they've tramped. I don't s know where they are. He drew again quietly at his pipe. Unless you should take it into that head of yours, he went on, that you was included in the treaty, here's the last word that was said. How many are you, says I, to leave? Four, says he, four and one of us wounded. As for that boy, I don't know where he is, confound him, says he, nor I don't much care. We're about sick of him. These were his words. Is that all, I asked? Well, it's all that you're to hear, my son, returned Silver. And now I am to choose, and now you are to choose, and you may lay to that, said Silver. Well, said I, I am not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. Let the worst come to the worst, it's a little I care. I've seen too many die since I fell in with you. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you, I said. By this time I was quite excited. And the first is this, here you are in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost, your whole business gone to wreck. And if you want to know who did it, it was I. I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land. And I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans, who is now at the bottom of the sea, and told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable, and it was I that killed the men you had aboard of her, and it was I who brought her where you'll never see her more. Not, not one of you. The laugh's on my side. I've had the top of this business from the first. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. Kill me if you please, or spare me. But one thing I'll say, and no more. If you spare me, bygones are bygones. And when you fellows are in court for piracy, I'll save you all I can. It is for you to choose. Kill another and do yourselves no good, or spare me and keep a witness to save you from the gallows. I stopped, for I tell you I was out of breath, and to my wonder not a man of them moved, but all sat staring at me like as many sheep. And while they were still staring, I broke out again. And now, Mr. Silver, I said, I believe you're the best man here, and if things go to the worst, I'll take it kind of you to let the doctor know the way I took it. I'll bear it in mind, said Silver, with an accent so curious that I could not, for the life of me, decide whether he were laughing at my request or had been favorably affected by my courage. <coughs> I'll put one to that, cried the old mahogany-faced seaman, Morgan by name, whom I had been in Long John's public house upon the quays, whom I had seen in Long John's public house upon the quays of Bristol. It was him that knowed Black Dog. Well, and see here, added the sea cook, I'll put another again to that by thunder, for it was this, this same boy that faked the chart from Billy Bones. First and last, we've split upon Jim Hawkins. There he goes, said Morgan with a note. He sprang up, drawing his knife as if he had been twenty. Avast here, cried Silver. Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you 
was captain here, perhaps, by the powers, but I teach you better. Cross me and you'll go where any many go a good man's gone before you, first and last, these thirty year back. Some to the yard arm shiver my sides, and some by the board, and all to feed the fishes. There is never a man that looked me between the eyes and seen a good days afterwards, Tom Morgan. You may lay to that. Morgan paused, but a hoarse murmur rose from the others. Tom's right, said one. I stood hazing long enough from one, added another. I'll be hanged if I ha be hazed by you, John Silver. Do any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me, Ward Silver? Bending far forward from his position on the keg with his pipe still glowing in his right hand. Put a name on what you're at. You ain't dumb, I reckon. Him that wants shall get it. Here I lived this many years, and a son of a rum punch and cock his hat athwart my house at the latter end of it. You know the way. You're all gentlemen of fortune by your account. Well, I'm ready. Take a cut, lass. Him that dares, and I'll see the color of his inside, crutch and all before the pipe's empty. Not a man stirred. Not a man answered. That's your sort, is it? He added, returning his pipe to his mouth. Well, you're a gay lot to look at anyway. Not much worth to fight, you ain't. Perhaps you can understand King George's English. I'm captain here by election. I'm captain here because I'm the best man by a long sea mile. You won't fight as gentlemen of fortune should, then. By thunder, you'll obey, and you may lay to it. I like that boy now. I've never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pair of rats of you in this here house. And what I say is this. Let me see him that lay a hand on him. That's what I see. Eh? And you may lay to that. Or there was, there was a long pause after this. I stood straight up against the wall, my heart still going like a sledgehammer, but with a ray of hope now shining in, in my bosom. Silver lent back leaned back against the wall, his arms crossed, his pipe in the corner of his mouth, as calm as though he had been in church. Yet his eye kept wandering furtively, and he kept the tail of it on his unruly followers. They, on their part, drew gradually together towards the far end of the blockhouse, and the low hiss of their whispering sounded in my ear continuously like a stream. One after another they would look up, and the red light of the torch would fall 